Hello, Booktube, and welcome to another weekly reading vlog. So this week I've been working on uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone by J.K. Rowling. This is a reread. Rowling, Rowling, Rowling. Uh, the Complete Illustrated T Fairy Tales of the Brothers Grimm by Jacob Grimm and Wilhelm Grimm. And the Grammar Book, an ESL EFL Teacher's Course Second Edition, Marianne Celsi Mercia and Diane Larson Freeman. Uh, as you can see, the camera I'm using will show things in mirror image when I hold them up to the camera. It's, it's a phone camera. So uh, apologies for that. The whole video is going to be like that, unfortunately. And while I'm making apologies, I, I suppose I should perhaps also apologize for my appearance. We're, uh, we're still under a very strict COVID lockdown here in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, well, uh, where I'm currently filming. Um, that's somewhat of an excuse, maybe. I think maybe I would be able to go out and get uh, razor and shaving cream, possibly. Uh, the, the directives are a little bit confusing, but possibly not. And we're, we're sticking very close to home these days because uh, the whole city is locked down. Uh, so, you know, for a while I wasn't shaving just because I was stuck in the apartment and I was just lazy. Uh, but but now I'm not shaving just because of uh, this scarcity of supplies during this COVID lockdown. Um, I do have to say, though, I, I had a rather unflattering glance in the mirror today looking at how scraggly and rough I've become. And perhaps uh, once I can get out again, uh, I'm, I might try and invest in some shaving equipment uh, once again. But you, you'll just have to put up with me for today. Uh, yeah, and, and the, the hair is going to stay like this until the barbers open up and who knows how long that's going to be. Anyways, that that, uh, that little personal detail out of the way. Uh, let's get into the reading. So the grammar book, uh, I read uh, 16 pages this week from page 176 to 192. As I mentioned last week, uh, for the rest of the time that I'm on lockdown here in my apartment, the grammar book is on the back burner. Uh, I, I'm looking, because I'm trapped here in the apartment, I'm not really doing well with my studies, and I'm looking for more escapist type reading and less professional development. So I'm just reading two pages a day, you know, just turning the page once, just to keep it somewhat active, but not really making great progress with this. So I finished up the last couple pages of chapter nine, which is the tense aspect modality system and discourse. And I'm on chapter 10 negation in which I made a point of trying to read a couple pages a day. Now, granted, some of these pages were a little bit light on text and uh, a little bit heavy on sentence diagrams, which, which looks intimidating perhaps, but um, is actually quicker to get through this than it is to get through a paragraph of written text. Uh, chapter 10 is on negation. So how do you go from a positive sentence in English, like uh, I went to school, to uh, a negative sentence in English, I didn't go to school. Um, it's fairly common uh, stuff, especially if you've been teaching English uh, for a while, although I've, I've got to say, I'll, I'll, I'll drop this bit in here. When I first started teaching English, when I was in Japan, uh, when I was an assistant English teacher on, on the JET program, uh, this was one of those things that I'd never thought about before, where I was watching the students, the Japanese students in a junior high school, learn how to make a sentence negative in English. And, um, was watching the Japanese teacher explain it to them and realized for the first time just exactly how many moving parts there are in making a sentence negative. So for example, she goes to school. Uh, in order to make this negative, we have to invent uh, an auxiliary. Uh, so we have to create the do, and then we have to put the tense and the third person singular s on the auxiliary does and then we put the negative marker after the auxiliary 
so it wasn't just simply a matter of putting not in the sentence. They had to transfer the third person singular S onto an auxiliary. They had to remember to put the auxiliary in, uh, and then they had to put in the not. Um, so the, the, I, I remember that being one of the first things that impressed me about realizing that I did this subconsciously. I didn't even realize I was doing it where they had to memorize the rules and consciously think about all these manipulations that they had to do with the sentence. So that that is in here. Um, but if you've been teaching English for any length of time, and this book is designed for people who've been teaching English, uh, it's, it's, of course, very basic stuff, but, you, you know, this, this book is trying to go through everything thoroughly, so you, you have to include this. And there, there are some interesting things here. Um, you know, uh, this, some of the little things, what, what, sorry, what was interesting to me? Um, I guess w one thing that the fact that uh, in older English, we used to make a negative by putting it after the main verb, uh, and that this was still preserved in somewhat rhetorical or formulaic English. For example, John Kennedy's speech, ask not what your country can do for you. I, I, I thought that little bit was interesting. Uh, I, somehow I didn't really realize this or I'd forgotten this, but when do changes to don't, there's a vowel change. Uh, I, I didn't do, don't. Yeah, I mean, you know, it makes sense when you think about it. Um, uh, lots of other little details here. Some of the most interesting stuff is buried in the footnotes when they talk about all the exceptions to common rules and stuff like that. Oh yeah, the the, the contractions. Of the, you know the fact that uh, you know do changes. Sorry, do not would change to don't. This is a debate actually I got into when I was doing teacher training still, um, where I was training new teachers and they wanted to teach the the students to to say do not as a proper form and then don't as the optional contraction. Uh, whereas what, what we were suggesting is that you start off with don't and then later you draw the attention, the student's attention to the fact that don't is more formally do not. And, and the new teacher trainees were resistant to this, but uh, I, I was using my own daughter as an example. She's a toddler and picking up language naturalistically as toddlers do and I said you know we never say do not to her we're always saying don't <laughs> don't eat that don't step on that uh, don't touch that um, what am I doing I am wasting time rambling here uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna move on because there are other things to talk about in this video I, I could talk more about negation in English but I, I'm gonna move on okay uh, next one, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Now, again, this is a reread, uh, but I, I did finish it off this week. I had been on page 210, and then I read 122 pages this week to the end with, uh, yeah, to the end. It's uh, 132 pages. I don't want to talk too much about this because I'm hoping to do a full review of that sometime this week. My, my system is I try and hold off on making the video review until after I've put my thoughts down on the written review. And depending on how busy I am, uh, that can take me a few days. And it's, it's been a busy week. Uh, even though we're in lockdown here, I'm still teaching online and have a number of tasks this week. But uh, yeah, in brief, um, the first half of the book I thought I was, and again, this was a reread, but I was, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed the first half of the book. I, I, I had forgotten how good it was. The second half of the book is less focused on having fun and more focused on the mechanics of the plot, which I didn't enjoy so much. But it's, it's a little bit hard to tell if that's me or if that's the book because I, I, I knew the plot already. You know, I'd seen the movie, I'd read the book uh, a few years ago. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a reread for me. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure how much to criticize that 
during a reread, but I do have to admit, just in terms of talking about my own reaction to it, I, I felt I felt a little bit bored by the second half of the book. Um, but I was able to finish it off easily enough. I, th I think I'll hold off there and save the rest of my thoughts for um, a full review, which I hope to have up on this channel sometime early this week. We'll, we'll see how things go. And then The Brothers Grimm. So I read 108 pages of The Brothers Grimm this week uh, from page 694 which is uh, story 162, The Wise Servant, up until uh, page 802, which is story 193, The Drummer. Uh, so as you can tell by my bookmark, I'm getting there. Uh, pro probably we'll finish off this week. Uh, in the uh, final edition of The Brothers Grimm, which is what this is, there are 200 stories and 10 legends. And I'm on story 193, so just a few more stories to finish up, and then the, the main legends. As I've been saying every week, uh, there's a fair amount of repetition in these stories, which is um, one reason it can be a little bit tiring to read. But there, there's also, I, I, I don't want to overemphasize that and say that every story is just a variation on the story before, because there, there are some new stories here and there are some interesting stories here. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can talk about a few of them. So, some of these, um, because the stories can get a little bit rep repetitious, some of these, uh, even though they're all stories I've only just read this past week, some of these I, I would... I don't... They... they, they you almost forget them as soon as you remember them. Sorry, you forget them as soon as you read them, or it's it's difficult to talk about them. Um, but I, I can talk about a few of them, maybe. Uh, page 162 is The Wise Servant, and it's a very short story, just a paragraph, uh, one big paragraph and a little paragraph. Uh, it's, it's about a man who's got a, a, a boy who is his servant, and uh, the cows go missing, and he sends the boy out to look in the cow and the, for the cow, and the boy has gone all day, and he's rather worried about them. So he, he goes out and he sees the boy running up and down the field, and he said, Where have you been? Didn't you find the cow? And the boy said, No, I found something better. Three blackbirds. Uh, and the master says, Well, okay, where are the three blackbirds? And he says, Well, I can see one, I can hear the other, and I'm running back and forth after the third. Uh, and that's where the story ends. And you're like, huh, well, what was the point of that? Uh, which is not atypical in this collection. You do have a lot of stories where you're wondering, what was the point of that? But what I found was interesting is that later in this collection, I don't remember which story it was, but uh, somewhere between 162 and uh, 190, 193, uh, there was another story in this collection that referenced back to that story. They said, well, careful here. We're going to end up like the boy who was chasing the three blackbirds. Uh, so, so another character in a different story would reference back to the character who was chasing the three blackbirds. Um, and I thought that was an interesting little meta thing there. Uh, although it probably wasn't intentional because uh, the, these, these are a collection of stories that the Brothers Grimm collected. So it's easy to imagine that perhaps a boy chasing the three blackbirds in the field was a famous story or a famous proverb. Uh, and then it got referenced in another story, uh, uh, you know, as, as sometimes famous stories do tend to get referenced in other stories. Um, but for, just for the reader reading through these, uh, seeing a reference in one story to a story you've already read before, I thought was interesting. Page 163, The Glass Coffin. Uh, so this is about a traveler in the woods. Lots of these stories about travelers in the woods who finds a mysterious stag, who brings him to a mysterious mountain, who finds a princess uh, who's in a glass coffin, and then the princess comes out of the coffin. Uh, and then half of the story really is just the princess telling her backstory about how she ended up in that coffin. Um, 
Then story 164, Lazy Harry. Uh, I, I don't really remember this one. Um, then 165, The Griffin. I, I kind of remember this one. This this is, uh, I think, uh, one of the guys who gets sent out on quests. Uh, 166, Strong Hands. I remember this one. This is, this is about... Uh, th th this one was actually interesting, even though it was uh, sort of a combination of a couple different stories that came before, like most of these stories are. So it's, it's about a boy who gets stolen off... Um, by the robbers and he lives with them until he becomes really strong and then becomes reunited with his father. Uh, similar to a story that had come previously about a boy who gets kidnapped by the giants and then becomes really strong and then comes back to his father. In both stories, the son has come back and he's way too strong and the father doesn't know what to do with him because when he sits down, he breaks the chairs and when he puts his bag down on the table, he breaks the table. But then he goes off on adventures and he meets a couple other uh, people who are really strong. And, and again, this is somewhat of a, a trope in these stories. Uh, it's an element that gets repeated about a character wandering around and picking up other characters with, with uh, fantastic abilities. Um, and then they, they are staying at a castle where there's a dwarf who keeps beating them up. Uh, and then they, they find out that the dwarf is guarding a, a treasure and a princess. Um, it was, yeah, it was all right. Page one, sorry, story 167, The Peasant in Heaven. Uh, this was an interesting one. Uh, it's, it's another really short one, just not even one page long, as a lot of these stories are. Um, so uh, uh, there was a very pious, poor peasant who dies, and uh, he goes to heaven, and he gets to the gate of heaven the same time as a rich man. Uh, and they're waiting at the gates of heaven, and St. Peter opens the gate and sees the rich man and says, Oh, we've been waiting for you. Come on, we've got a big parade all ready for you. And he takes the rich man in, and there's all this parade and celebration, and he doesn't even see the, the poor peasant uh, at the gates of heaven. Um, and then uh, he comes out the next day and sees him and brings the poor peasant in, and there's no parade and there's no nothing. And the poor peasant is like, Huh. You know, I, th I thought here in heaven the poor will, would be rewarded, but I, I can see it's just uh, just the same as it is on the earth where people love the rich people and forget about the poor people. And St. Peter says, oh, that. He says, don't worry about that. You're going to get all the same rewards in heaven that everyone else gets. He says, it's just that uh, we get poor, poor fellows who come into heaven every day, but a rich man does not come into heaven more than once in a hundred years. Um, so this, this religious story is, again, quite common in the Brothers Grimm. There's a lot of stories that have to do with God and St. Peter. Um, in fact, a, a couple more just in the stories I read for this week. Um, I, I thought that was a clever little ending. Uh, I'm not sure. It, it, well, it, it, it is very in line with what the Bible says about how it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than for a camel to get through an eye of a needle, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, if you were going to get political about it, I, I suppose you could take that both ways. Uh, you know, Republicans might get upset that it's bashing the rich. Uh, and then people on the left, Marxists, might get upset that a story like this is made, is designed to keep poor people servile and say, well, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. You'll get to heaven and the rich man won't. So don't worry about how much money he's got now. Um, but politics aside, uh, moving on to the next story, Lean Lisa, uh, yeah, I think this is about a woman who just keeps complaining to her husband all day until he threatens her. And then that's the end of the story. The hut in the forest, uh, yeah, this is about three girls who go out to a hut in the forest, uh, and, um... Yeah, they get lost in the forest. They go into the hut. There are three sisters who each successively get lost in the forest. Uh, and uh, the, the person in the hut says, you can fix dinner for us, um, but they never give any food to the animals. So then they get locked in the cellar. But then the last girl, the youngest, is really kind and she cares for all the animals. 
So then it turns out that the the old man uh, is really a prince in disguise and the animals are his attendants and they've been bewitched, uh, waiting for the perfect girl to take care of the animals. Um, I, again, very, very typical. This, this is how all these stories keep running together. Um, this, the next one, Sharing Joy and Sorrow. This is another very short one, just uh, a page and a paragraph here. So it's, it's a tailor who's got a, a wife, uh, and he, he's a vicious man. He keeps beating her. So uh, the judge says that he has to share the joy and sorrow with her. Um, and uh, he still keeps beating her, so he gets brought by, back before the judge. And his excuses, he has said, I have shared joy and sorrow with her also. For whenever I hit her, I was full of joy and she of sorrow. And if I missed her, she was joyful and I sorry. So that's kind of the punchline here, which... Um, you know, put that in the category of, uh, boy, you couldn't write stories like that today. Uh, you, you couldn't make a joke about that today. Um, but the, the good news is that the, the judges were not satisfied with his answer and gave him the reward he deserved. Uh, what that is, they, they don't say. Typically in these Brothers Grimm stories, actually, someone ends up dead by the end of them. Uh, but uh, they, they don't say, so... Maybe you just got fined or put in the stocks or whatever. Uh, uh, the next one, the Willow Wren. Uh, this is about a contest the birds have to see who's going to be their king. Um, there, there, there was a... Um, I don't think I've read this story before, but I've definitely read elements of it before. Or I don't know, maybe I have read this story before. They, they decide the, the, the one who's going to be king is the one who can fly the highest. So uh, all the little birds give up easily, and the big birds fly higher and higher and higher. And the willow wren, who wants to be king, just uh, rests on the back of the hawk. And the hawk doesn't realize that, or sorry, the eagle. The eagle doesn't realize that the willow wren is on his back. So when the eagle fl flies as high as he can and can't fly any higher, then the wren just jumps off his back and, and flies up. And uh, that is supposed to be, well, sorry, Th there's a couple more antics in the story, but that, that little part of it I definitely have heard before. I th well, I don't know. I, I, I wanted to say that I, I heard that in a different source, but maybe I, maybe I did re read that in a Brothers Grimm collection at one point. I don't know. All right. Uh... Next is, uh, oh, yeah, next is a rather similar story about how the fish are choosing their king, although this one is, is much shorter, story 172. Um, uh, next is about uh, two people get transformed, in, two shepherds who get transformed into birds. Um, Uh, next is about an owl who goes into the barn door. Uh, sorry, an owl who, who is uh, staying in a barn. And all the village people think it's a, a hideous monster. Uh, they've never seen an owl before. Uh, what was the next one about? Uh, yeah, the next one was about the moon. Um, so it uh, says, uh, you know, in the old, old times, everything was dark. And then three travelers came to a town and they saw that the town was lit up at night. And they, and they said, what is this? And they said, well, oh, our, our mayor has bought us a moon. Uh, so we just keep the moon filled with oil and it, it lights up the streets at night. So they took the moon back to their village. And then after they died, their wish was that the moon would be cut up and buried with them. Uh, but then because the moon was cut up and buried with them, all the dead people under the ground came back to life because now the moon was under the ground. And they got into quarrels. And so St. Peter had to get the heavenly troops down into the underworld to uh, fight off the evil one and uh, restore order. And then 
Yeah, and then he took the moon away with him and hung it up in heaven, and that's why it's in heaven now. Um, I'm, you, 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 can, you can imagine maybe some epic battles in that story, but the, uh, there, there aren't any there in the description. It's just the, the actual story is just two pages. I've essentially told you everything that's in it. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, you, you do have these rather interesting, charming stories that are in the Brothers Grimm. That one was only two pages. I hate to complain about this, but um, I find in my reading experience the uneven length of the stories is an annoyance. I don't know, maybe I'm just too sensitive. But, I, you know, I find there'll be several short stories next to each other. And I'll feel like, oh, okay, uh, I, 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 I'm getting into the groove, getting to the rhythm of these very short stories. And then there'll be a story that's like 10 pages. And I'm like, ah, oh, I don't want to read a story that's 10 pages. I, I don't know. I, I, I find when I'm used to reading shorter stories, I groan at the longer stories. Next is page 176, The Duration of Life. Uh, this is kind of like a, a just-so story. This one I thought was pretty clever. Uh, so uh, at the beginning of, of time, God is assigning each animal how long they're going to live. And so the donkey comes up and the, God says, you're going to live for 30 years. And the donkey says, well, 30 years is awful for a donkey. All I do is work. And so God says, okay, I'll take 18 years off of you and, and uh, you only live for 12 years. And then the dog comes. Uh, and uh, God gives him 30 years, and the, the dog says, that's much too long for a dog. Uh, one, once I grow old, uh, no one's going to take care of me. So, so God takes some time off from the dog, and then the monkey uh, doesn't want to live for too long, so God takes some time off of him. And then man comes up, uh, and God, God gives the man 30 years, and the man says, oh, 30 years, that's too short. Uh, I need some extra time. Uh, so God gives him the monkey years and the uh, dog years and the m donkey years. So, but sorry, the, not in that order. First the donkey years, then the dog years, then the monkey years. So as a result, it says man lives 70 years. The first 30 are his human years, which are soon gone. Then he is healthy, merry, works with pleasure, and is glad of his life. Then follow the ass's 18 years, when one burden after another is laid on him. He has to carry the corn which feeds others, and blows and kicks are the rewards of his faithful services. Yeah, there is some truth to that, although, well, although I can't really complain in my life. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there, there are, I think even nowadays, uh, childhood is... is um, if you come from a privileged background, at least childhood is, is, is uh, a time when you don't have a lot of responsibilities for others. Uh, and even up through your 20s, if you delay family, which a lot of people do, your 20s are, are for yourself. But then uh, having a family in your 30s and 40s is uh, definitely the, the shift is uh, for you as a provider rather than you having like uh, your, your own fulfillment. I'm all, uh, running out of time here. There, there are other interesting things to talk about here. Uh, Death's Messenger. Uh, Death's Messenger, the, the publisher's back copy says Death's Messenger is uh, one of the darker tales which deserves to be better known. I didn't think it was really all that great, although it, 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 it was no better or worse than any of the others. Story 178, Master Frem, about uh, a... Uh, Guy who always finds fault with everything, and then he gets led into heaven, and he finds fault with everything at heaven. The goose girl at the well. Yeah, this one was all right. Um, uh, Eve's various children. Then this is, was an interesting one. Uh, this is another one of those. Uh, a, a few of these, a number of these stories are kind of apocryphal uh, Bible stories, and a lot of them take place with Adam and Eve at the beginning of time. Um, or all, all of the apocryphal Bible stories do, I should say. I'm out of time. So uh, there are some other stories I read this week, but I'm going to cut it off here and ramble more next week.